Good morning, everybody. Hopefully you had a wonderful start to the new year. So thanks for being on the call today and welcome to 2020. So uh, we are going to get started here with a few odds and ends. So one thing I wanted to make sure that you did remember is that um, we do have a website called Your Portfolio Review. If I can bring up my uh, bring up the web browser here, see your yourportfoliorreview.com. This is not something that's going to get somebody to actually call you, but this is fantastic to give you credibility. So if you've already met with somebody and they're and you want to give them a resource on why going through the process with you makes sense, this is a fantastic content-rich um, uh, uh, site that's going to tell them why going through the 21-point checklist with you or what we call the, the full checklist uh, with you is a good idea. So don't forget that we have that that tool for you, okay? So let me get out of here. Link. Okay. Uh, train your brain to remember anything you learn with this simple 20-minute habit. So have you all heard of the Ebbinghaus Curve? You probably have all heard of it in one shape, maybe not in that name, but we've all been exposed to the actual concept. But this breaks the, the actual um, um, numbers for this is that when you memorize something, so this is the knowledge retention, this is how you can remember it, and this is over time. So obviously the longer you go out, the more you forget. But it shows that uh, in the first 20 minutes, uh, we're gonna forget almost 40 or a little over 40% of them. Uh, over the, at the um, After the first hour, we're gonna forget um, well over half of what we've learned. For one day, we've learned, <laughs> forgotten two thirds of what we've learned. Over six days, we've forgotten 75% of what we learned. And over a month, we've lost 80% of what we learned. So how do we combat that? Has anybody seen this or anybody seen how you combat this? It's a relatively easy thing when you know what you're doing. So retention immediately, okay, so here's the forgetting curve. As soon as we, after 20 minutes, like we said, you're already down, you've forgotten 40% of what you uh, um, learned. The way to combat that is after 20 minutes, you do a 10 minute review. And then what you do is you see the curve would go down. Then what you've done is instead of this blue curve going down, 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 by doing that 10 minute review after you do that, uh, uh, 20 minutes after you've learned something, it brings it right back up to the top again, and then it slows that curve. You see how the curve's getting less steep. But then what you do after one day, the next day, do you have to do a 10-minute review, or can you do a 5-minute review, guys? 10-minute or 5-minute? Five 5-minute. Five minute. And then look what it does to the curve. And then the, if, if, a week later, just a week later, look what happens. Just a 3-minute review, and look what it does with the curve. And then um, a month out, you just do a 2-minute review, and look what happens to the curve. So when would be – what would be an appropriate um, – use of this uh, science here, this research here, would be an appropriate use of that. Not for the MIFT, guys, for the MIFT, what are we supposed to be doing with the MIFT, guys? The 15-minute drill, what are we supposed to be doing with the 15-minute drill? Is that for memorization? Is the 15-minute drill for memorization? No, what's it for then? Yeah, it's got learning better communication skills, learning to ask open-ended questions versus closed-ended questions. You know, we're, we're right in the middle of the, the football playoff season. So just a reminder, guys, what are the two skills, what are the two, uh, quote-unquote, football skills that we're working with with the 15-minute drill? One is learning to tackle better, and the other is learning to read offense, read the offense or tape review. So what, what you're doing with the 15-minute drill is not memorizing anything. What you're doing is you're learning to listen for mistakes so you can, when you make a mistake real time, you'll be able to recognize it. And then you're learning the skill of how to overcome that uh, uh, mistake so that when you make it real time, you're able to correct it on the spot. So that's the 15-minute drill. This, as most of you have said, this is better for scripts. So this is what you're going to use for scripts, because then you are memorizing. 15-minute drill is not about memorizing. It's about thinking on your feet. This uh, is for scripts, because scripts are memorized. Does that make sense? So there's a lot of science to this. Uh, and you can see down here, if you want to read an article on, on why this works and how it works, that's a great place to go.
So this, the, the gentleman that wrote this for Inc. Magazine, wrote this article about the Ebbinghaus curve for Inc. Magazine, he tried it, and here's what he said. I put this specific formula to the test. I keynoted at a conference. I was able to take in two other one-note keynotes at the conference. One of the keynotes I took for no notes, and sure enough, just shy of a month later, I can barely remember it. The second keynote that he listened to or watched, I took copious notes, followed up the spaced interval formula. A month later, by golly, I remember virtually all the material. In the case you're wondering, both talks were equally interesting to me. The difference was the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. So this stuff does actually work. So just memorizing something isn't good enough. What do you have to constantly do? Go back and learn it. And, and you know, just two minutes invested a month by a month later, just think how fresh you can keep this stuff. Does that make sense? Um, Ron, thanks, Ron, for sending me this article. Baby boomers make this retirement mistake more than any other generation. Uh, without reading this, before you even read it, what's the mistake they make, guys? What do you think the mistake baby boomers make? Too much in the market. Too much in the market. Why do baby boomers put too much in the market? And we make this case about our competitors. Because when our, most of our competitors are our age, and when did we get into business? In the 1990s. What happened to the market in the 1990s? What happened to the market in the 1990s? Boom! Okay, what's happened to the market the last uh, <laughs> 12 years now? Boom! So guess what we assume? Yeah, my, my son and millennials, millennials are way younger than boomers. How many are do millennials act like boomers or do they act like the generation greatest generation when it comes to investing? The greatest generation. Remember the greatest generation? They were afraid of the market or they loved the market? Did the greatest generation love the market or were they afraid of the market? They were more conservative. Why? They lived through the what? Their formative years were lived through the what? The depression, yeah. And the millennials, their formative years, what they lived through. The, the Great Recession. So guess what they guess how they view the market? The market is dangerous. That 2001 and 2008 till. The market is so here's the thing. Millennials are not right. Boomers are not right. Is the market a great growth tool? Yes. Is there risk in the market? Yes. So how do we how do we marry those two things? The the great growth potential and the inherent catastrophic risk that you can see in things like 2001, 2008. That's right. 50-50. Hedge your bets. Hedge your bets. So we want to talk about um, uh, something that, that boomers don't consider, especially when they retire. And unfortunately, too many advisors don't consider either. Houston, this is right out of Mother Jones. Houston has seen 300-year floods this year alone, and three 500-year floods in the past three years. What's the point of that? Is there any such thing as a 100-year flood or a 500-year flood? No. 500-year floods can occur three times in a summer. See? And the reason we want to talk about that is this. Markets fall by as much as 10% historical frequency. Every 11 months, 15% every 24 months, 20% every four years, 30% every decade, 40% every few decades, 50% two or three times per century. Has the market fallen <laughs> of 50% more than two or three times in the past century? In fact, since 2000, how many times has the market fallen 50%? Twice, yes. Now, in the last 12 years, how many times has it fallen 15%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50% in the last 12 years. In the last 12 years? No. Guys, holy cow. Zero. It's fallen 10% a couple times. Hasn't fallen this far in the last 12 years. We're in the longest bull market in history. <laughs> so what does that tell us, guys? Return to what? No, not even intra-year, not even intra dude. Not even intra-year. 
we haven't seen these these kind of uh, drops in the last 12 years, even intra year. I mean, period. Period. So what are we seeing then? Return to mean, and when we see return to mean, are we going to see the next bear market is going to be a 20% downturn? Or what's it way more likely to be? Yeah, big. Big. And when you look at recovery times, so Great Depression, it, uh, a number of months in, in uh, 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 up was 325. After World War II, for 49 months up, 158% gain. Post-war boom, uh, 1949, 86, uh, 86 months of bull market, 266%. Look at all these. I mean, this is, this is, these are all the bull markets. Okay, so right now, and this is uh, uh, we're 130 months now. So how does 130 months compare to any of these numbers? How does 130 months compare to any of these numbers? And we're already well above the 334%. We're closer to 425%. So how does it compare to these numbers? So again, what are you looking at? See, we're already looking at what? The longest bull market in history and the highest bull market in history. So what happens after long bull markets? What happens after high or long... Uh, this is what happens. Green is good, red is bad. Green is good, red is bad. Green is good, red is bad. Yeah, so th that's right, Kill A long bear or a short bear? A long, slow, and it doesn't need to be go going down, but it means, I mean, did the market go down for this period of time? No, it just didn't do what? The market didn't go down significantly during this period of time. It just didn't do what? It just went sideways. market didn't go down, just went what? Sideways. So that you know, market didn't go down. I mean, it had it down, up, 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 but it went sideways, sideways, sideways. What do we after 15 years, or after I'm sorry, 12 years, 13 years of bull market? Guess what we're looking at over the next. And why is that important? Now the other thing we look at is the Schiller Cape, the Cape ratio. Where are we with that right now? We're at the second or third highest. Actually, it's a little bit higher than this now. We're at the third highest it's ever been. So these are this is problematic for us. So why is this important? We all know that the market's going to come up. When the market goes down, what does it do or what has it done 100% of the time? It always comes up. It always comes up. So then why are we worried about it? Why? The only people we work with are retirees. So why are we worried about the market going down? Because we know it's always going to come up, always has, always will, as far as I'm concerned. Because if we don't believe the market's going to continue to grow, we might as well buy beans and ammunition. Because if I don't believe that the, the economy is going to grow, I may, might as well buy beans and ammunition and build myself a shelter that's well defendable. So I, I, I'm a true believer the market, or the, not the market, the economy is going to continue to grow. But is the market and the economy the same thing? No, they're not. And has the market gotten a, a significantly ahead of the economy? Has the market gotten significantly ahead? Yes, we're in four times now. So why is that a problem for retirees? What do you mean by timing, David? You're right. Ah, Nick, sequence of returns. Sequence of return, sequence of return, sequence of return. Investor A, $100,000 investment, $100,000 investment. B, with no withdrawals, look it. Uh, it doesn't matter how you get the returns, whether you get a first three bad years or the last three bad years. In the end, the amount is what? The same. So for millennial, that's fine in their 401k. Both of them average 6.09. Both ended up with the same amount of money. Why is, that, why is this significant when it comes to our clients? Because our clients are what? Making withdrawals or not making withdrawals? They're making withdrawals. So now if you look at a $5,000 withdrawal on the Visser A and a 5000 on B, if they start out with three bad years, boom, down to 41000 Start out with three good years, they're up to 112. What kind of a difference is that, guys? Same average rate of return. Is that a small difference or an unbelievably huge difference? Look at it again. 
right here. So this is uh, actual numbers from actual um, um, time periods. This is 1969 to 1998, 10.5% average rate of return. But look at so is which one's higher, 10.5 or 9.6? Easy math, 10.5 is higher. But because they had significant downturns in the first five or six years, they were exhausted by 1988. So within, what is that, uh, 10, within 20 years, they're out of money. Within 10 years, they're out of money. Over here, they had a slower, a lower average rate of return. But look at it, it grew to what? Five times more. So it all depends. So that's starting in 1979, going to 2008. So these are actual numbers. One, the average return rate of return is higher. You're out of money within 20 years. The other average rate of return is lower, and you do fine. So it has nothing to do with average rate of return. It has everything to do with what? It has nothing to do with average rate of return. It has everything to do with what? Sequence of returns, the sequence and how you get them. And if we're at the top of the market for the last, if we had a bull market run that's completely blown every other bull market other way, is there a significant problem with sequence of return right now for our clients? Yes, there is. And you remember here about uh, six months ago, and then I, I talked about it again about uh, six months before that, we showed what if people had pulled out of the bull market in 1997? What if they pulled out in 1997? How much would they have been hurt 10 years later? They pulled out in 1997. They missed the last three years of the bull market. How much would they have been hurt three years later? I'm sorry, uh, uh, 10 years later. They wouldn't have been hurt at all. What if they pulled out two years early? What if they pulled out one year early? Were they ever hurt? Were the people that pulled out three years, two years, or one year early, were they hurt 10 years later? No. In fact, they came out ahead of the people that held on. So if we're going to pull out, when should we pull out? Everybody's saying it. Yeah. When the market's high, 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 high. And with our mentality, do we need to pull it all out? Or do we need to pull out just a, a, a big chunk out and put it aside? And when we put it aside, are we saying that they're not going to get a good rate of return? Do FIAs give them a good rate of return? Yes, it does. So I'm looking back 50-year retirement period. This is uh, using Monte Carlo. Take a 70 to 30 percent uh, portfolio, and here's how here's how a million dollars would have grown with no re with no withdrawals. But when you look at it with withdrawals, now we got what? See, this looks fantastic. This becomes a little more dicey. So there can be big, significant differences when you have negative returns at the beginning of your retirement or at the beginning of any period of time. It means it's going to be a long time. So if you've got clients that are below 70 years old or early 70s, Sequence of return can really, really cripple them for the rest of their lives. So if we look at forecast versus historical, if returns fall, you must withdraw less. So this is forecast. This is historical. So this is the chances your money will run out in 30 years based on initial withdrawal rate. Why is the forecast, why is the forecast, and this is from Money Magazine, why is the forecast a much higher chance of running out of money than the historical? Where are we on interest rates right now? <laughs> Is that a good thing or a bad thing going forward for most people? Bad. Where are we with the stock market right now? So when you combine the lowest interest rates in 200 years history, the lowest interest rates that we've seen in 200 years, and a bull, a record bull market. Does the forecast mean that this, does that sound like a forecast where the market's going to do well over the next ten years, or we got some, we got all the wind in the sails, all the fuel in the tank, or what? Empty. We got challenges. So that's why they're saying five percent withdrawal rate, eighty-two percent chance of failure. Historically, it'd only be a thirty-four percent chance. But now, even with a four percent, you didn't have any chance of. Of failure, but you got a 57% chance. Even with a, a 3%, you still have a 24% chance, a 24% chance of, of uh, that's a 50-50, 50% stock could respond, 
of, of, of running out of money. So these are things that we, I mean, these are, uh, we've got problems here. And again, what does Ibbotson say we should do? Stocks and FIA is going to give you the highest rate of return, the lowest uh, risk, for over the, be, with the exception of, uh, you know, having all your money in stocks. But right now, is that a good time to be having all your money in stocks? No. Make sense? So that's why we do a 50-50. And if you add on putting an HECM in, in, on the side there, do they need to pull from their HECM? Guys, I don't sell HECMs. We're here about what? Yes, we want to make a living. We want to sell product. But we're really here to do what? We can make a living and we can sell product by doing the right thing or the wrong thing? The right thing. It should every one of your clients have an HECM there just in case they need to withdraw money. Because can they? Uh, how, how, how easy is it going to be able to get an HECM when things go to heck in a handbasket? I don't sell HECMs. I have no. That's, I, I have no interest in that. All I'm saying is it's the right thing to do. It's right to have it there because the, what has it? Uh, what was the study that you should uh, get an HECM at the last resort, or you should have the HECM sitting there in case they need to pull money out when the market's down 50 percent? It should be sitting there. This is something you should all be doing. And, you, and will you look like heroes? Because uh, will you like look like heroes with your clients if you present? The information on that. Now, the other thing when it comes to spending, I found this in um, the ARC Bulletin, October 2019 ARC Bulletin. This is a really cool little thing here because it shows that is, every, does, is the amount, I mean, there's a lot of different things that go into how much somebody should pull out of their account or can pull out of their account. And I thought this was a really cool little um, uh, thing that puts that to, to uh, uh, put that to real life uh, situation. So, share of your financial resources that's guaranteed income, share of your spending that's needs, not wants. So it says, put in value on your guaranteed income. So if you have a Social Security and pensions, put down the amount of your annual guaranteed Social Security and pensions. Multiply that number by 20. This is your current value of your total guaranteed income. The other thing to be here is if they have uh, annuitized annuities. So you'd have Social Security, pensions, and annuitized annuities. That's your guaranteed income. That means you're going to get that come heck or high water. It doesn't matter what the interest rates are. It doesn't matter what's going on with um, uh, the markets. You're going to get that money. So you want to calculate that. Then determine your net worth, your bank, your balances, your investments, your home value, minus any debts. Add all those things up. Okay. Then add your guaranteed income's current value to your net worth. That's going to be your financial resources. Now divide your guaranteed income, all of these things, your Social Security pension, that, that number right here, divide that by your uh, uh, financial resources. So what they're trying to determine is how much of your financial resources do you, uh, will, uh, will continue on no matter what happens. Okay, that's what they're looking for here. Then what they want you to do is figure out what share of your spending that's needs. And what, give me some example of needs, guys. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Before I, uh, um, see, can you make sure I uh, address Howard's question there before I, uh, when we get done here? Yep, I sure okay, will. So needs are what? Food, shelter, clothing, medical. That's right. Food, shelter, clothing, medical. That is not remodeling. It's certainly um, maintaining your house in a workable manner, but it's not remodeling, making the kitchen look beautiful. It's not putting a pool in the backyard. It's not vacations. It's not getting the newest car every three years. That, that, those are wants, not needs. So you want your needs. What is the nut to crack for you to survive? What is the nut to crack for you to make sure you're taking care of your food, shelter, food and shelter, et cetera? Then, so which, how much of your, uh, of your wants? So if I want to spend 200000 but my nut to crack is 100 where would I be here? If I want to spend 200000 but my nut to crack to, for food, shelter, everything else is, is 100000 where would I be? I'd be at 50%, right? 50%. Because out of 200000 50% of that, 100000 of that is needs, the rest is what? Wants. Okay? So, and if, I, if um, again, what I'm going to look at is what share... 
of my guarantee. If I have a, a, a big chunk of my money, um, if, if my um, if I have a million, um, uh, if I have five million dollars, and my guaranteed income comes up to one hundred uh, or to one million dollars, that means I'm what? About twenty five or twenty twenty five percent, right? So do you see how it differs here? The difference between three point six and two point nine, and is that a small difference, guys? In between 2.4 and 6.9, if most of my income is coming from pensions and Social Security uh, and, and annuities, annuities, I can pull out a heck of a lot and, and, and basically, um, uh, so, so you see, this is a great way to customize it for your clients. So if you really want to go and figure out how much somebody can, can pull out, there is a, a, a and is this 100% accurate? No, but is it a heck of a lot more accurate than pulling a number out of the air and saying 4% or 3% or 3.5%? So I would, um, I would have this in your back pocket just in case somebody is right on the edge of, of uh, or is putting you, to the, uh, putting you to the wall and what they're able to spend. Does that make sense? So the biggest, what do you think the biggest thing I want you to take away from today's call? Now is the time to what? Prepare for what? Yeah, to lock it in, Ron. To lock it in, lock it in, lock it in. And what if we're too soon? What if we lock it in too soon? Will that hurt our clients? Yeah, they're not going to hurt me hurt at all. Make sense? So, what you've mastered... The crib notes and motive. So the crib notes being using that Ebbing House memory curve. So learn something, review it for 20 minutes, review it for 10 minutes, review it for five minutes, review it for two minutes, and you got it down. So use that Ebbing House curve. Your daily practice of the MIFT, which is not about memorizing scripts, but instead about getting better communication, paying attention to those uh, five-minute money breakers and breakdowns you get every um, week. That's when they close every client you want. And guys, when you don't close a client, when you when you don't close a deal, get on the calendar to talk to Jeff. Get on the calendar to talk to me. Let's make 2020 the year you close every single client you want to close. Is that a deal? Does that sound like a plan? Awesome. Great. Mike, you guys have a great start Mike, of the Mike, 2020, Mike. and we'll talk to you all next Monday. Thanks, everybody. Mike. Mike, oh, don't wait, forget wait, wait. Oh, uh, Howard, you had a call. Uh, anybody that's question. wondering about the HECM? Yeah, that, that, anybody that's wondering about HECM, that's a home equity line of credit. So you can look that up on Google. It's a home equity line of credit that you can tap into if the market falls so you're not having to go after your counts that are down. Does that make sense? Super. Everybody have a great rest of the week, and we will talk to you all next Monday. Thanks, everybody.